Hello and welcome to another Total Education Lecture. Today I'm going to be talking about themes in the Tempest and I know the language was going to be the last one in the Tempest but I've had a, a request from um, one of my subscribers, Amber Lights, and I certainly hope that name is one of those fake internet names, uh, to talk about the themes and talk about discovery especially. Now, for my overseas viewers, and I know there are lots of those, we have um, in New South Wales here in Australia, we have a particular theme we have to devote to this text. And I'm going to spend the first five minutes or so of this lecture talking about how we analyse discovery in the Tempest as one of its themes. Now, normally this wouldn't be a theme. Um, so what I'm going to do is also discuss the, the other themes, the more commonly studied themes in the Tempest, after I talk about discovery. And I'm going to, for, the, for those people in New South Wales and Australia, I'm going to link those themes back to discovery as well. But for my overseas viewers, you might like to skip through the first few minutes if you don't want to discuss discovery as a theme. Now, discovery as a theme is a very artificial concept put on us by the um, syllabus requirements here in New South Wales. And we really have it forced upon us and we really need to force discovery into the Tempest as a theme. This benefits us in many ways, although it's a very tight constraint, in that you can't necessarily be wrong because whatever you say that you discovered in the play or you thought about in the play or you linked the theme to it, as long as you've got supporting evidence and some examples to support your view, you can't be wrong. And, and because it's been forced upon us, that, that's accepted. I think, and I'll talk about the other themes in the play are, and the ideas are interchangeable, of course, in, in many ways, but the other themes I'll talk about as we go through are the, the, the sense of the journey, power, ruling, leadership as another idea, freedom as another theme, revenge, and probably marry that with forgiveness and reconciliation. I'd love to talk also about love and marriage, and magic and the supernatural. Now, of course, those themes, and we wouldn't list themes like that in an essay, but I want to talk here today about those themes in particular and show how they interlock and so that when you come to talk about themes, any of the themes, they all link together and they're sort of interchangeable and they mingle and flow and you wouldn't need a long list like that, you'd probably only take two or three and you'd be able to work the concept of the others into it. And they're easy to manipulate. So for example, I could talk about Miranda and what she discovers and she discovers in the play love, people, um, her past, a new life, and power in many respects. Now, Prospero discovers forgiveness, freedom, and he does that in the concept of a journey, doesn't he, really? So, you can see how those ideas flow into each other and intermingle and interchange. I'd like to start talking about discovery and what we can discover through, through an analysis of the plot, really. And with each um, discovery that you make or, or ones that you choose to use in your work or your essay, I need you to think about supporting them with a very specific example, and I don't have time in these short lectures to go into that, but you'd need to look for a specific example in the text, you'd need to then find um, any techniques that were in there and say how those affect the audience or affect what's happening in the play. So you cover all those bases. Really basic essays will talk about the theme, better essays will talk about obviously give a quote and use technique. And then the best essays then talk about the effect of those things. So you might want to remember that to add when you're talking about these themes. Okay, let's go through the plot. And I've got 11 sort of basic plot points here that show clear discoveries. And you wouldn't use all of these. And you'd pick, as I've said before in the other lectures, you'd pick scenes that support those ideas. If you go back and, and re-watch or watch for the very first time the other lectures, they give very specific examples of all these things, but I thought I'd, I'd put them together here for you to make it much simpler and easier for you to find your own if you so desire. Okay, so what we have here first is we could talk about discovering the island and how they come to the island and the sense of magic and all those sorts of things. And then after that, Miranda discovers her past and we learn that, that why Caliban wants his revenge and we discover his motives for that. Then we discover the, the journeys that, that all of the characters went on to reach the island. Then we talk about 
discovering the idea of power throughout the text and, we, and Caliban comes into it and we see that, that role that we can turn back to a sense of freedom or colonisation or any of the themes that run along those lines that you'd like to talk about. We discover love and we do that through Miranda and I've covered that very extensively in the character analysis on Miranda and you might want to go back and look at that. We also discover here the concept of utopia and power and how different characters see power and the idea of we discover through that a sense of hope and freedom and power and love and you can mingle all those things into that. There's, we discover on the way through the, the subplots, we discover the, the sense of comedy that runs through one subplot, we get the sense of treason that runs through another plot, subplot and you can link both those things to, to use and misuse of power and the idea of colonisation and all those sorts of ideas if you wished. Um, we also discover nearer the end of the play, of course, the sense of forgiveness and unity. Um, we also discover a sense of loss in many ways. And we also discover a sense of theatre, e.g. the mask. And I'd like to talk, you know, I've talked about that in other, in other lectures. And you need to think about getting into that, what you discover through the play and come up with some of your own ideas about discovery. But they're the basic ones that you could manipulate into it. And I think it's important to, to not treat them in isolation but to link them into the ideas and link them into your own opinions and how you see the play. Um, as I stated previously, I'd probably approach an essay in this, on The Tempest um, through scenes and then you can talk about the characters and the themes that are in that scene and it binds your essay together a lot better and a lot stronger, I think. Um, helps you anal analyse the question and learn, you know, there's two or three scenes in here that you could use effectively to do that. Moving a little bit away from discovery, although I will link back to it of course, is the other thematic concerns that, that are more commonly thought of um, when we look at The Tempest and, and when we read critical literature on The Tempest. The sense of journey is one thing and, and the sense of journey here is can be looked at in, in a few ways and there's the imaginative journey that the audience goes on. There's the imaginative journey that some of the characters go on through their dreams and the magic and all those sorts of things. There are the physical journeys by sea and, and by, by land and, and walking around and all those sorts of things. Um, the, the initial imaginative sequence that, that you might want to discuss when you talk about this is that the, the sense of journey that the audience goes upon with the Tempest and how he uses the Tempest for suspension of disbelief and that imagination that we need to carry into the play itself and how he conjures that imagination with all the different scenes and the actions. Um, the characters also have personal journeys that they go on and, and they use to change and I think it's important if you think about those sense of the, those personal journeys and how, how they change and that, the idea of I suppose self-discovery along the way and you could work that in as a, as a thematic concern as well. I think that would be quite effective for some scenes. I like also when you think about imagination to think about the masks and I've covered that very extensively in the language lecture and they're sort of little imaginative journeys that you go on and, and there's lots of sense of and you can link that back to the idea of power with Gonzalo's utopia and the imaginative journey he goes on conjuring up that, that perfect world and the wonderful world that everybody seems to think and want to carry across. I'd like also to talk about power. Um, I think power is very important in the play and it links to that concept of colonisation which seems very important to more modern critics and if you look at the critical literature uh, over, over the more recent periods and probably this century, later this century after you know colonisation became a big sort of negative feature in um, world discussion that Critics have said it's a play about colonisation and it's really only about colonisation and, and feminists have taken the same argument up, it's only about feminism with Miranda. I think we need to, as students of the play and as students of Shakespeare, take a, a broader view and a more holistic view of the play. And, and while there are elements of colonisation probably in, in The Tempest and there's certainly elements of power and power relationships, um, I think we need to think about what is the power in the play. Um, who has the power in the play? Is it really fleeting? What role does the magic play? And the, the, you know, the Prospero gives it all up in the end anyway. We also talk, the play does talk about the nature of leadership and leaders and, and, and what happens here. And I think you'll find that 
the idea of power can be linked back to discovering oneself, discovering power and, and, and learning about elements of all those things. Some good examples you'll find are in Act 1, Scene 2, where you know the, the sense of the, the plan, Prospero is betrayed and we learn where Prospero is betrayed by his brother and all those sorts of things and what happens there. We learn about the nature of power through Ariel and Caliban and the promises of freedom that he makes. And you could link it back into that sense and that lecture as well. Act 2, Scene 1, The Betrayal Air uh, with Antonio and Sebastian. Act 2, Scene 2, Caliban's um, new master, Stefano, and the sense of power that we have through there. Also, Act 5, Scene 1, Prospero gives up his magical powers. I have a couple more themes to talk about. Um, before we run out of time. So I'd like to get on to the sense of freedom. Um, and that links very clearly to power with Ariel, Caliban, Prospero and Alonso. Um, all, that, all that need to be free in some particular way. And, and again, that links back to colonisation, the problematic relationship between the coloniser and the native peoples. And we see that very clearly in the relationship between Prospero and Caliban, of course, and Prospero and Ariel. And that move for freedom. And that very clearly, the, the idea of um, the freedom comes through in many ways through Prospero's use of magic and illusion, which is another thematic concern, the sense of the supernatural. And I sort of talked about a lot about those ideas in the language lecture, and you might want to go back and have a look at that. Magic is power to a certain extent and gives control, yet Prospero also sees it and he calls it an art. Um, and, and that sense of magic and, and creating it as an art links back and, and critics, and you can look this up on the internet, and I don't really have time to discuss it now in this lecture, but it's sense of Prospero as the playwright. He writes the script for this play, and here's Shakespeare in this play, and you can take that idea and we can discover that in the play if you like. And there's plenty of critical analysis on the net about that, um, and, and if you really want to follow that through, I look at it in, in great detail. There are elements in the play that you could pick up, but I think there are easier things to write about in our case. Another theme is love and marriage, and, and go back to Miranda's character study, and I spend about five minutes in Mar Miranda's character study talking about that theme, and in particular about her, and you need to go back and, and look at that for that theme. I won't repeat that here. The other, and probably the final thing that I like to talk about, is the sense of forgiveness and reconciliation in the play and that idea of loss and restoration to, to marry those two things together. Um, probably the best example is Iris, the rainbow goddess, um, who comes and ends the tempest in many ways with that, with that sense of rainbow, the end of the storm. And there are, there are other concepts that I'd like to talk to you about, and I found a really good example of this in Shakespeare Online on the net. And, and this little excerpt from Shakespeare Online, which I'll read for you, talks about how some critics see Prospero as not as forgiving as other characters. And you might want to think about that as well. It says here on Shakespeare Online, and it's an essay on Tempest, on Prospero and Forgiveness and Reconciliation, you can find yourself just by looking up Prospero, Tempest, Shakespeare Online. It says, Prospero goes through the motions of forgiveness, but his sincerity is lost to us. Moreover, there is clearly no reconciliation among Prospero, Sebastian and Antonio. Prospero still considers Antonio a most wicked sir. And that's Act 5, Scene 1, line 130. And Antonio, focused on slaying the island fiends, will not even acknowledge Prospero. The th a thorough discussion of the themes of forgiveness and reconciliation in the play must consider Prospero's treatment of Caliban. When Prospero comes to the island, he taught Caliban his language and his mannerisms. At the beginning, Caliban welcomed Prospero, delighting in the attention he would receive. And then it goes on to talk about the relationship between Caliban and Prospero and what should happen. And that Caliban um, goes back to his bestial nature after he's dead, and he feels less guilty. And, and it says in the end of this section, um, for Caliban, Prospero has no mercy or forgiveness. Prospero brands him a born devil on whose name nurture can never stick. Act 4, um, scene 1, lines 188 to 189, and vows, I will plague them all. Act 4, scene 1, line 190, true. Um, and so there's this 
there's some doubt over, over the sense of forgiveness and reconciliation that we have in the play. I don't necessarily hold with that view, and I think if you go to Act 5, there is some sense of forgiveness between Caliban and Prospero, and I've, and I've discussed all that in very great detail when I've talked about Caliban's. But you might like to have a look at this approach and think about it very carefully. Well, that's really all I have time for today. I'd like to thank you for requesting this video. If you have any questions or any additional content or things that you'd like to hear, I'm really hoping this is going to be the last uh, lecture on The Tempest before we move on to do some other interesting literature. Don't forget, help us out. Press the like button down below if you enjoyed this video. Please comment, ask any questions. If you didn't like it, comment. And don't forget to visit our website, totaleducationcenter.com.au. There are plenty of products there that will help you in your studies. And we hope that you've enjoyed this. Thanks for paying attention. Good night.